All right. Welcome to the eighth call for the Wharf Project. Uh, it is now the beginning of February, and we've made quite a bit of progress on this project. In this call, we are going to dive into the progress and where everything is at right now. Uh, talk about some of the design decisions that have been made over the past couple weeks since we've had a call. Um, and then look at a little bit of where we're at now in terms of the reprioritization and the focus on getting to the point where uh, Wharf is at a, the session kit specifically is going to be at a point where it could effectively replace UAL and EOSJS. Um, I will hold off on that for now. I'm super excited about that part, but coming back to kind of just progress. Um, the GitHub repository is expanding pretty rapidly right now. Um, if you scroll through and just kind of keep tabs on it, you're going to see tons of new repositories being created. Um, these are all, they're all standalone right now. Um, we may look at some sort of bundling process somewhere down the line. I know that further complicates things, and our team in general is not a huge fan of the mono repo approach, where you just have this one repo with tons of stuff. Uh, it does add a lot of value when it comes to synchronizing versions uh, for systems like this, where there's lots of deployments. Um, but as we saw with Transit specifically, Transit being the project that EOS New York years ago was working on, um, if it goes unmaintained, it becomes much harder to maintain because that one central mono repo is kind of the you know, the thing. Um, and if that one thing stops being maintained, then the whole system kind of falls apart. We, on our team, experienced, uh, like, we could no longer update Anchor within the transit ecosystem because that one repo, which was out of our control, the mono repo, um, we couldn't issue updates to anymore. So we don't want to replicate that situation. Um, we're going to deploy everything as standalone repos. But there might be some sort of super repo that uses Git submodules to pull in repos if we decide to go that route. Uh, there's conversations going around this right now. And if anyone listening or anybody in the call has thoughts or ideas, like we're open to that kind of feedback to try to make this easier. Um, but as of right now, they're all being created standalone. So when this is all said and done, I think I said this in Telegram too, there's probably going to be 40, 50, 60 repositories. Uh, they're all going to be very small uh, projects. They'll all have templates, which the templates themselves are going to, uh, it's going to add to the count. When I say 50, that's going to probably te be 10 templates or so. Um, but yeah, so in terms of overall architecture, we're, it's, it's being put out, and we're very much seeking feedback if that exists, if anybody is strongly opinionated, if anybody has like experience on, like, this is why this worked in using this approach, and maybe this is why it didn't. Um, all good feedback to be providing. So the in terms of non-code, non-GitHub related stuff, uh, the website is continuing to be worked on for uh, the project as a whole. Um, still working on kind of the framework for documentation itself. Uh, we had the blog update, you know, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where we actually got into the point where we can write blog posts and include technical content with code samples and like, you know, create a good uh, user experience for consuming the content. Now it's a matter of, okay, let's move out of the post realm and come up with a really nice hierarchy of information on that website that for people who are going to be building front ends know to go down this path and people who are going to be working on node.js backend stuff they can go down this path um, and all these various kind of trajectories for different developers that might take advantage of wharf um, other trajectories including like plugin developers you know we talked about the plugins a little bit ago and the templates but ideally we will also have some sort of guide that is wrapped around something like the wallet plugin template. That is probably a bad example because not everybody makes a wallet. Um, but the transact plugin template, which I don't know where it went. It's probably a little bit further down. Um, there it is. 
This one will be more common for people to use. This is how you modify the behavior of a transaction. Um, you can clone this and then create your own plugin to modify the behavior of how your application processes transactions. So there's obviously going to need to be guides around that, ways to onboard people into that flow. So that way, whatever user experience you want to create for your application, you start here, learn about the session kit, and then you get into plugin development. Whether that's, you know, you could make a plugin that's just part of your application, cool. Or you can make a plugin that you publish on GitHub and then um, other people can use it too. So hopefully, uh, for most purposes, it'll be a pretty trustless uh, experience because most purposes, I imagine, are going to be for uh, dApps in which you know there's no keys, there's no there's no inherent risk of anything being stolen. But when it comes to plugins for Node.js backends, um, there's going to have to be some security considerations, and maybe you will want to only use your own homebrew transact plugins. So. Um, in terms of overall progress, we think, looking at the milestones, that we're going to be submitting that uh, the second milestone, I think it was, we just recently redid the numbers, the one that has the session kit and the transact framework, uh, that we're going to submit that one as uh, complete, at least for MVP. Um, there will obviously be some changes that will come along to it, but if we actually kind of look at the work that's being done, uh, like you can see this kind of massive PR that's working on the user interface, we haven't had to touch the session at all. Um, the session has worked great. Um, there's some plugin stuff that's happening, or is that the session? That is the session, but there's very minor changes happening. Um, no actual functional logic being done. So we think we're pretty well secured in that milestone being completed. And now we're moving on to the next part, which is the user interface. So not sure when that'll happen. Um, probably within the next week or two, we'll submit that as kind of formally complete. I don't think we're necessarily in a rush to do it. We're, we're really heads down working on the user interface portion of this all, which is what this pull request is. Um, you can see in our pull request, if you really want to dive into the code, we have this 0.3 release, uh, which is just pending. It is, I think it's kind of empty. Yeah, it's got one commit in it right now. But this is a pull request that goes from the UI branch, which is where all the work is happening right now, into the version 3 branch, 0.3. Uh, the 0.3 release will be the first release that includes an interface, you know, like a user interface. Um, and allow uh, interactions between the session kit and application and uh, something like Anchor or the Wax Cloud Wallet or uh, whatever other wallets that are supported within these plugins. So there are going to be some breaking changes. We, I, we shared a pull request that I actually merged the other day um, on a kind of a design philosophy and just there wasn't a whole lot of feedback on it. I don't think anybody's thinking about it quite as hard as we are right now. Um, but the gist of this is just that we are going to start following a pattern on how parameters of function calls are defined. Um, we're always going to start with the subject matter of the function call first, like the primary thing. Um, like if you're calling transact, the first thing's going to be the transaction. Um, Following that will be arguments, which is the thing that's required. And then following that is the options, which are all the optional flags. There were a lot of calls before in version 0.2 where those were kind of all bundled up and there was no consistency of it. The Some things were required within the parameters and some things weren't. So this is just kind of a design philosophy change, or at least a standardizing of it. Um, it is going to create a breaking change from 0.2 to 0.3. I don't think there's a lot of people using this yet. There are a, a couple, which we'll put in the release. We'll make sure we address this in the release notes. Um, so people who do upgrade are going to experience this and have to change how they're using the session kit. Um, but better to rip this Band-Aid off early than later. So that's coming up. 
Um, but overall, that's primarily where we're at. There's a ton of UI work happening right now. Um, the UIs are in design. Uh, I've seen plenty of Figma mock-ups of what these UIs could look like, what the various elements are, how we address branding. Um, I, none of that's implemented, and I, I don't. I wouldn't be great to walk through that um, because I bet you if I opened it up right now, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that uh, is new, and it'll be all smattered about stuff that maybe is legit. So. We would just be kind of meandering through a Figma diagram that is live and change. Um, but that's coming soon. The stuff that we're going to look at is no CSS, no styling. So, um, but I mean, before I kind of get into the UI side of things, was there any progress questions uh, or any thoughts on? the stuff I've discussed so far in terms of progress or design decisions we've made? Um, maybe this is on topic for now, maybe later. Have a sure. go over the um, packaging and uh, what the plans are. As you mentioned, you know, maybe get sub modules or, or something else. Um, so that would just be interesting to dive into um, yeah. a little bit. I mean, I'm not, not too crazy about get sub modules. Yeah, me but, neither. Um, you know, I think it might be worth the discussion, and maybe we'll get some ideas from other people on the call. I don't think we have to do it today. I don't want to yeah. track us from the yeah. UI work. I think, I think the trajectory we're on right now, where it is just everything is its own standalone repo, gives us the opportunity to package it in different ways. And it, you're right, it's not super immediate need. Um, Right now, though, like I'm recognizing while well, I'm working on this stuff, and I'm sure the other devs working on it are seeing the same thing, is that maintaining uh, consistency when you're working on an application while you're juggling like six different packages gets difficult. You know, you upgrade one and the other one might fall out of sync, sort of thing. So, yeah, totally. You want the same set of packages across all the stuff. Yeah. The package manager can let. If you have different versions of packages for, for different things, it's not good. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, the, so the, the, the way the code's uh, separated now, check, looks good. You know, the, the problem on the dependency management is real, check. And I think there's options on, on how to address it. And that's a good, maybe a good topic for some other time. Yeah, agreed. And I just kind of loaded this up quickly to show. Um, I started uh, Warf integration on Unicov as like a real live test. Um, and you can see kind of the package management here that I had to do. Uh, I had to include the session kit and then all of the plugins for the various wallets and then the actual renderer itself. So at some point, having these all kind of bundled into one kit to make it easier would be a big benefit. Um, but also still having this so that way those who really want to do this granular thing can. Um, I think both options would be really good. So I I ended up pushing this up to development and this one, this private key plugin was 0.1 and 0.1 was incompatible with uh, UI-6 here. And so the, like the continuous integration failed and it was like, oh, okay, now I gotta go in and update that. And, this will all be a little bit easier once all of these are actually a version one and we're following Semver. Um, but right now it's it's hairy. <laughs> so yeah, it's another exciting part of this. It was really cool to drop it into a Unicode de uh, development build and like it works. You can log in with it and the transaction part's still in flux, but it was really cool to see that in like a live application after that so long. Cool. That is really cool. I was also looking at the uh, the open block explorer, all the pull requests happening on that, and I couldn't help but think like, I feel like I'm racing some of the commits happening right there because you guys on the OBE are like pushing towards getting some good wallet integration experience, and I'm kind of doing that in parallel. So it's been super interesting to just watch that happening. Hopefully, we've motivated you. 
It it does. I mean, I'm following along. I may not be commenting, but like I was just reading that pull request yesterday, um, and then like looking through the code and trying to decipher exactly like what design what design decisions were being made for the user experience and like how that might fit into Wharf. Um, yeah, super cool stuff to see. Yeah, I'm excited about it. There's there's some stuff hopefully happening where that'll it'll get a little bit more attention. Uh, more resources and hopefully more usage by all the yeah. antelope chains, which has always been our goal. So, yeah, there was just an instance with an MSIG uh, recently where it was doing the, it was setting an ABI and then in the same transaction was consuming the ABI. And I know you and I talked about that uh, like months ago for mm -hmm. OBE. And some of these other explorers weren't rendering that property or properly. So yeah, I was I like, that in there. Jeez, I yeah. wanted it to work. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, well, this is an approach that you know was taken. Like, if you guys want to fix your explorers, this is how you do it. So that's not wharf related, but I mean, it goes to show, you know, just the kind well, of the we, open source nature of everything. Hmm? We do want. I mean, it, the, the relevant pieces that we're we're using. You know, we want to use your latest stuff, right? So right. We, we're using the current EOSAO core everywhere possible. We will use, you know, the session kit once deemed, you know, available and, and stable enough to use, and um, and we'll migrate to the Wharf version of EOSAO core once available. And yeah, we want we want. I I operate by knowing where to find examples of the code that. That's like just how I operate. When people ask questions, I'm like, okay, where is it that I know this is done? I go on GitHub and I link them to the line of code as an example. So I, you know, OBE is a great place to to do that, right? I, yeah. I, most everything you want to do is done there somewhere. I can just give you a link. So exactly. And if those links show them how to use Wharf to do it, that's an extra win. Yeah. Well, and this I guess is a good topic for for anyone uh, checking out this recording or getting interested in Wharf is like as soon as we hit a more stable position, OBE is going to be one of those projects that I, like I personally hope to have the time in you know a couple months to look at as an actual implementation test case and maybe contribute to myself, um, maybe help start the integration on that side so that way it's not all on your shoulders. And then OBE could become one of those examples, one of those code examples that's like, this is how you do it. Um, so if there are open source projects out there, obviously I can't contribute to something that's closed source. I don't, I want it to be a living example of how to use these things. Um, so if there are open source projects out there like OBE that would want that sort of attention, um, feel free to reach out to me or into the Wharf various community communication channels for Wharf. Um, and we're open to helping on that front. It's not going to be immediate, but that is one of the best ways for us to help shape this framework is by actually going out and doing the implementation with the developers that are working on specific projects. So we did it with Anchor, and it provided so much valuable insight. And we're planning on repeating that with Wharf. Cool. Well, when you say it's when when you say it's ready, then we're ready to have yeah. that happen. So, well, randomly someday you might see a draft pull request started by me, <laughs> where it's like, here we go, guys. <laughs> Do it. Yep. Do it. Yep. That's what I did on Unicove. That was that Unicove PR I showed you guys. Like, I just one day was like, I need to see this in a real application and how it feels in a real application. And so I started that draft pull request and just started the implementation, started ripping things out and putting new things in and always fun. Good stuff. Yeah, cool. Well, we can kind of jump over to where we're at on the UI front right now, just kind of an update on that front. Um, Again, there are no CSS styles applied to any of this. And the actual renderer itself, if you go look at it, it's the, it, I think it's called the web UI renderer with dashes in between on GitHub. Uh, it's a mess. It is not intended to be used yet. Uh, it's more of a 
prototype in a playground right now. I guess I can just quickly kind of jump to it. Um, the web UI renderer, this guy. Um, I'm not even marking it 0.1 yet. I, I would not recommend anybody use it. Um, there's no project structure. It's, but this is like our playground right now to start testing the integration with all of the various components. Um, the package JSON itself will look kind of familiar to the Unicode one that I briefly showed. Um, I'm showing that there's a peer dependency of the session kit. And then in the dev dependencies, uh, you can see there's some wallet plugins. There's also the session kit again. Not sure if that's actually normal for it to be a peer and a developer dependency, but I kind of needed this for the unit tests. Um, this is actually kind of out of date, but this is the live version. It's running on my laptop right now, or my computer. Um, and there are multiple wallet plugins currently in existence for this thing. Um, Anchor, I know you won't be able to see this when I click it because I'm just sharing the browser window. But like this is opening Anchor. And I am clicking login with Anchor. And you can see it just logged me in. So the like Anchor login integration is starting to work. Um, this is set up to use the Wax testnet right now. Let me change that really quick. There it is. Demo. Let's enable some other chains. Uh, it is multi-chain. Uh, this was one of the big reasons we started on the wallet integration so earlier with login. If you click Anchor, right? Anchor supports um, the user within Anchor making the decision of what blockchain they're using. So you saw me log into the Wax testnet before, and I'm going to say Anchor again. And this time, I'm going to log into Jungle 4. Like, I'm picking this in Anchor. And now the application is logged in on Jungle 4. Like this session is active for Jungle 4. Um, it Anchor has that capability, but not all wallets have that capability. Um, like now I'm going to sign in to Wax. Now I'm on Wax. Um, the session kit handles that logic. But uh, in the other side of things, if you were using like the Wax Cloud Wallet, the Wax Cloud Wallet, I don't, that window didn't pop up either. Um, it's only going to support Wax. It's like the logic paths for the UI need to understand the capabilities of the wallets themselves. And so that's kind of a new development that's come out of this part of the, part of the thing. The Wax Cloud Wallet plugin itself actually has a property on it that says which blockchains it supports. Whereas something like Anchor, it's supporting all chains, it doesn't even need that decision. Um, we're going to add the kind of the scatter slash token pocket slash all of the other wallets that support that protocol um, as the next plugin. But it'll be similar to the private key signer, where if you use the private key signer, now you need to pick a blockchain. Like both the private key signer and the scatter plugin need the user in the interface to decide which blockchain they're going to use before you actually ask the wallet for the login. So it's kind of this decision tree model that, that is happening in the session kit now to determine like how we render the choices to the user and how we make it so that it is the most optimal flow based on kind of the wallet or the authenticator that the user is actually using. Um, Obviously, with the private key thing, it doesn't care. But if that was the scatter plugin, it would have prompted for a login to EOS using scatter. But like the user has to pick that up front. And to kind of further complicate this, like when we add a ledger one, the ledger one, you're going to not only have to select ledger, and then it'll say pick a blockchain. But when you pick the blockchain, it's also going to prompt for um, picking an account. And that user interface is going to be something like there'll be a little status wait. It's going to try to connect to the ledger. Um, we already need to know the blockchain you're trying to connect with. So now we're going to connect to the ledger, 
get the public key or maybe the first three public keys or some number um, and then query the the API endpoint by the public keys to get what accounts are capable of being signed with for that ledger. So that then the next step is going to be a, a selection box that says, here's the wallet or here's the accounts you can use from that blockchain. You know, select the account you want to log in with. Um, and if it's not a ledger and maybe the private key one, uh, maybe it's not a select, but a text input. Um, this all of this go going to show that the behavior of the renderer itself through the session kit needs the flexibility to make decisions based on the choices the user is making. Uh, we think that the way it exists right now in the session kit, uh, actually, I'll just jump over to go to the anchor plugin. Um, and that was updated two days ago, so I think this is current. Yeah, this wallet configuration is what is controlling this. And the renderer is what reads this. The first option there is, is that it indicates whether this wallet requires you to select a blockchain. Like, or that's where it pops up and says, you know, what blockchain do you want to log into? Uh, and the second one is whether it requires you to select permissions. This actually should be false for Anchor. I think maybe I'm just, is there a dev branch? There's a dev branch. <laughs> there we go. Um, Anchor doesn't require the chain select. So we're telling the user interface through the wallet plugin configuration that, no, 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 we got this. Anchor has this capability itself and doesn't need Wharf to do that for them. Um, and this is the same thing for uh, the permission selection that I was talking about there at the very end. Um, and then going one step further, I believe the WAX plugin, that not published? Maybe it's on a different branch. Master, maybe it's just not committed at all. That's probably what it is. There's a, there's a new field called supported chains, which is an array of blockchain IDs that the wallet can say, you know, like in the Wax Cloud Wallet instance, it's literally only for Wax. It is a custodial hosted thing that only works for Wax. So the, for the plugin for the Wax Cloud Wallet, we need to be able to tell Wharf that. Like if you pick the Wax Cloud Wallet, it's just gonna log you into Wax. Like you don't get any other choices. This plugin is gonna handle the flow for you. Um, and you'll be good to go. I imagine for uh, many other platforms that do this kind of thing and many other wallets that only support singular chains, um, they're going to need to use this parameter as well. So that exists dated yesterday. If we go to the UI branch, I believe it is in session. Wallet plugin config. Doesn't even look like it's merged in yet. All right. The joys of working in so many repositories. They're not all necessarily published yet. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is largely where we're at with the interface. Uh, this is the Svelte-driven interface right here. It is embedded. This test, I think I've talked about it in the past. Uh, if you run make dev with the UI renderer, it serves out a single HTML file that includes the renderer. And then the renderer uses Svelte to render down to web components. And the web component, like that's what you're seeing here. Uh, if we actually look at the element, you can see there's like a shadow DOM element which contains all of the um, actual interaction that's happening, and it is just in a dialogue element, a native HTML dialogue element. So that's how all of this is being done. Uh, it's made the reactivity of all of this pretty good. Uh, like if you see the live updating, like if I do a test transaction, you can kind of see that flicker by, there's stuff happening. Um, if we use the Wax Cloud Wallet, does that pop up? Nope, not in this version. 
in the latest version, there's actually a box that pops up here and says, look for the, like, check the pop-up and log into the Wax Cloud wallet. And there's actually a pop-up window that shows up that prompts you to log into the Wax Cloud wallet. Or if you are logged in, asks you to share your identity with, it just says localhost in this instance because it's a dev environment, but that all works as well. So that I think is kind of the quick rundown where it's at. Um, the All the wallet plugin interface stuff is happening in these repositories. If somebody wanted to make a new plugin, like these repositories, the anchor one and the wax one are based on this template. I just went through here and did the, I'm not logged in here, but there's a clone template button here that you can then start a new project with this template. That's how the um, wax and the anchor ones were created. They were just based on that template. Um, sessions getting updated, the UI renderer, like we said, is what's tying all of this together. But we should, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, like all of the, the login stuff is, login stuff's probably like 60, 75% complete. The transact stuff is coming up next. And then and once we layer the UI, like the CSS and the, the prettiness on top of the renderer, then we'll really kind of have the first functional prototype that other developers can include. Um, and that may be when we start doing some draft PRs, but we'll be like, this isn't production ready. This is just our way to start uh, testing it in real world situations. So. We're moving along rather quickly at this UI side of things. And uh, that's that's kind of why we didn't have a meeting last week. We are we are neck deep into this side of uh, the kit. Any thoughts or questions or anything on that front? I know I've been rambling for about 15 minutes. <laughs> Cool. Um, I don't know if we've talked about this on a call, but we're also building a console renderer right now. Uh, you have the web UI renderer, which we just talked about, which is uh, it's the thing that interacts with the session kit and the wallet plugins, ties them together, and then presents a interface in the web browser. This is the same thing, except it's for a console. It's for like a terminal. Um, we're looking at this itself is going to just be the renderer for console applications. Um, we thought about diving even deeper with it and uh, thinking about like how this could replace Cleos. Um, but we think that that's going to be another application on top of it. It's not the renderer. So the, the renderer scope right now is just to be able to interpret events coming from the session kit and render them in a console. Like what happens if uh, Anchor says, you know, show me a QR code and you're in a console? That's the decision tree that this renderer is going to have to make. We can print out QRs in the console. We've done it before. Um, it's always interesting to see if they actually get interpreted based on people's console settings. But um, Kind of the whole goal, though, is to make it so that if you're using the session kit, like imagine you're making a price feed application or something, um, and you don't want to specify a key in a configuration file that does the broadcasting of that Oracle. Um, you might be able to use the console renderer in that instance to prompt, like you start the price feed and the the renderer will prompt you to log into an account. Just like if you went to a DAP in your web browser and you click login, this would be like your, your console asking you to log in. Um, all of the wallet plugins will work there. So like if you wanted to log into that thing with Anchor, which you could. It could either render that QR like I was talking about, or it could just give you a clickable link in the um, the console itself. It could be one of those ESR colon slash slash payloads that you click, and it's going to prompt Anchor. You complete the transaction in Anchor, and then the callback happens in your console, and you get logged in. Like 
that's kind of what we're exploring here. The main goal of it, though, is to explore the API surface area, um, you know, and make sure we're not doing things that are too crazy in the web renderer that are impossible in a console environment. So it's, I don't know that it has a huge purpose just yet, like that example of being able to log into a console application with Anchor is one possibility. Um, but like our real driving factor here is to make sure that we don't get too crazy in the web world and start eliminating things that you may need to do in console. So something we did with Anchor Link that we're doing again with um, Worf. So if you go look on GitHub, you can find the console browser or the console transport for Anchor Link. And it lets you use Anchor Link in the uh, terminal, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I guess coming up is just going to be more of this UI work. Um, primarily, the whole kind of goal of this call today was uh, to give a status update. There's nothing really released to share or call to action on anything besides, hey, look. Um, but yeah, it's been a while and since we have had an update because we had a pretty quick release cadence to start with, with branding and you know the session kit with its core capabilities. Uh, and this one is, this one's a big milestone. So we're chewing on it and making sure we do it right. But that's about all I have. So if you guys have questions, comments, anything, happy to address those or happy to wrap this up in the not too distant future. That's good. Thanks for going over all that. Yeah. Absolutely. I it's nice to see the different wallets and then talk through the ledger example too, because that they're complicated. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, I could probably ramble on about this stuff for another hour if need be, but it's <laughs> I kind of went over most of it and uh in the sake of brevity, for the sake of brevity. Um don't need to dive that far down the rabbit hole. I am very excited. So is the team. And I think so are a lot of people that have started seeing what's happening with uh, the project in general. So don't want to let the excitement take me away, though. Cool. All right. Well, I am going to end the recording now. I'd say that this is a successful one. Uh, we will come back probably in another week or two. I'm not exactly sure. It depends on how quickly we move through on this. Um, but expect sometime in February for a meeting number nine to occur. So thanks for uh, watching and joining.